So we have a lot to cover in the hour, and we're here to talk about designing ve vehicles to accommodate older drivers' needs. Um, we have Michelle Chaka from Ford. She's been with Ford for 18 years, and um, uh, she has a BS and an MS in automotive systems engineering, and she focuses on advanced rulemaking and strategy, but um, she has worked on vehicle safety, vehicle crash safety for many years. Scott Schmidt is with the Alliance of Automobile Manufacturers. He's a senior director, and he's responsible for vehicle safety and regulatory affairs. Um, he coordinates the activities related to vehicle safety performance, driver distraction, and many other things. And Scott has a BS from mechanical engineering. And they are both here to talk about um, accommodating drivers' needs uh, with vehicle designs. So I'll turn it over to them. OK, well, I will uh, appreciate the opportunity. Um, let me just kind of do quickly. I, I, I heard a new term. Maybe it's because I'm not in this field quite as much, the silver tsunami. Tsunami. Hmm. Tsunami. That's what this slide is. Really, what it does is it defines the issue that we're dealing with, and it shows that we definitely have a much larger population coming, and therefore we have to pay attention to it. Um, yep, wrong way. I always start with a good news, bad news stories. I always give you the bad news first, simply because I like to end on a nice note. Um, the bad news is you can drive to the fountain of youth, but time waits for nobody, in other words. The effects of aging are real. They're gradual. They sneak up on people. My mind thinks I'm 25. I'm learning very quickly that I'm not. Um, they are very unique to the individual. Again, you can't say a 65-year-old person has got a certain level of impairment or a certain level of aging. I mean, it really is very in individual dependent. However, as a whole, there are certain types of physical and cognitive degradations that are consistently associated with aging. And as a result, vehicle manufacturers and the whole uh, vehicle safety community have to take these into account. Um, you've also seen this, the normal slides in terms of fragility. And again, what this is is looking at the number of deaths per 1,000 drivers. So, you know, basically this is if you're, if you take a 1,000 drivers in a crash, how many of them would have uh, been killed. And as you can see, you, the younger you are, the hardier you are to, or more resistant to injury. So what do we do about this stuff? Well, starting with the good news, people are more health conscious, you know, and realistically this is translating to much better cognitive and physical health, which is good. Roads are becoming safer. We're having a lot more, as you noticed, about the uh, Federal Highway and their design guidance, doing roundabouts, you know, it's much more targeted to the kind of crashes that um, older folks get into and to try to provide those uh, countermeasures. And like roads, cars are, being, are becoming safer. Um, we have a lot more crash avoidance and crash worthiness um, features. We also have the emergence of some of the advanced crash avoidance in V to V. Um, and in, as you heard from uh, Ron Medford and Google, we also have a future that uh, looks like it's going to be bringing um, some autonomous vehicles as well. Again, the good news is that, you know, this is uh, from IHS, is that, uh, you know, fatality uh, rates are dropping. This is per 100,000 licensed drivers. And again, what you see is that actually the very older segment is the one that's dropping the most. And uh, again, this is good news. This is that bathtub curve which shows a couple things. First off, what you see is again that um, fatality rates are decreasing and they're decreasing fairly significantly in the older age. But it also shows that on a, on a um, v VMT, vehicle miles traveled basis, that uh, again you see young drivers being very risky um, and it obviously the middle-aged drivers are the ones that have the best record and then as you get out there, your, your risk on a vehicle mile driven goes up. Now, this is one of the key uh, matrices that I use. Had Bill Haddon uh, was the first uh, NHTSA administrator, and he put together what they call the Haddon matrix, which really is a nice way of looking at auto safety in one sheet of paper. And really what it does is it looks at the human factors, the vehicle factors, 
environmental factors, which include roads as well. And it looks at it from a pre-crash, crash, and post-crash. And again, you know, while these are individual cells or matrix elements, they do have a lot of carryover. For example, vehicle construction and road construction have a lot of compatibilities. But for the most part, what I will try to do is cover at least the human factors and the vehicle factors. I will leave the environmental factors for another presentation in the future. So looking at the pre-crash for the human factors, we have age-related performance, alcohol, medication impairments, speed and risk-taking, restraint use, distractions, your experience and, and how you are being retrained, and even your exposure in terms of your VMT, how much you drive and day, averse, and day versus night driving. So when we talk about age-related performance, again, you have reductions in your perception, visual acuity tends to deteriorate. Um, you sometimes have hearing issues. Um, often there's cognitive declines, which impact working memory, selective attention, et cetera. And you also have the restricted range of motion, which often can manifest itself in mirror checking, looking over your shoulder to check your, drive, your, your uh, blind spot, or even simple things like getting to the, the seat belts. Oftentimes we'll hear, why aren't you using a seat belt? Well, I can't really reach it, because so these are some of the age-related performance aspects that provide the, the challenges the vehicle manufacturers have to deal with. With respect to alcohol and medications, this is a bit of a mixed bag. Um, alcohol is a, is a bit of a good news. In other words, that you see alcohol involvement decrease significantly with age, so older is wiser in this area. But one of the problems we have with the older generation is as they are aging, they're picking up a lot more medications. And so obviously, Medications have side effects, they have, uh, especially when mixed with alcohol, and so that's one of the emerging issues that people are spending a lot of time trying to understand. And it's not the kind of thing that you can necessarily measure on a breath alcohol uh, detector. So it's something that the caregivers and the aging people need to have some awareness of. It's also not something the vehicle manufacturers can necessarily directly compensate for. When we talk about risk-taking, again, this is area where older is wiser. Generally, the old folks are much safer in the, in, in the level of speeding and risk-taking. Restraint use. While it's not perfect, I would say that the statistics do show that older drivers, even though some of them really didn't start driving using safety belts, um, for the most part, their use is higher than uh, the general population. Um, however, further improvements should and can be pursued. Vehicle manufacturers have and are currently voluntarily providing more effective belt reminding systems, some of them a lot more um, um, intrusive, and they've also worked a lot to try to incre increase the ease of use of seat belt systems, belts on the, the, the uh, seat instead of way back there so they can get to them easier. Distraction, again, is a bit of a mixed bag as well. I mean, as you can see, Older drivers tend to avoid the distractions that seem to be, you know, with the uh, portable devices uh, that seem to be the uh, hot topic today among the younger folks. However, you know, they do tend to get confused about things. And so, again, one of the positive related trends is that a lot of manufacturers are making uh, user configurable displays. And that allows them to have a display that maybe shows all the various engine operating features for the younger folks who really care about RPMs and all that stuff. And yet, at the same time, you can have a much basic, much simpler display, which has your speed, fuel, and therefore is a lot easier and, and to comprehend um, and doesn't lead to confusion. So it's one area where vehicle manufacturers are trying to make things simpler. The other thing with the human factors is experience and training. And again, we know that experience works well because you have a consistent downturn or reduction in fatality risk as you get into your uh, 40s and 50s. So the, the longer you're driving, the more you have that fine-tune your, your abilities. But at some point, you, you see that starting to come back up. And so there are some programs out there um, that are developed to try to help retrain some of the older drivers to understand some of their limitations and maybe take strategies. I mean, maybe you don't, you, you think to yourself, do I really need to make that left turn? May, why don't I make a couple rights? Or I can go around and do a right. There's, there's some ways in which you can try to 
uh, address some of the most confusing roots. And, and for the most part, a lot of the older folks do encompass that naturally. They avoid high speed, uh, confusing um, roads that they don't feel comfortable on. The other thing that uh, older folks tend to do well is they limit themselves. Again, as you notice in these, chat, these graphs, uh, A, the, the numbers of licensed drivers decrease, but that's also, the whole idea is they also reduce their miles of travel. And maybe even just as important is they also really focus on redu reducing their, uh, their time of day. If you notice here that for the 70, 65 and the 75 plus, they really stop driving as when it gets dark. And I've noticed that with my, my own parents and my mother-in-law as well. And, and that's a very good strategy. Um, again, there's, it's sometimes it requires some adjustments. We've, as our family, have made all our family events earlier in the day so that she can get back home. Okay. Um, as part of the human factors, there's the crash and post-crash. And actually, you know, one of the things I just saw in, in uh, this slide probably has a little bit of a difference is in the post-crash, I probably would talk about that in terms of the, the frailty because, again, that really talks about how well you recover from your injury after the crash. The crash is what is your injury tolerance. One of the things when we do our, our vehicle design, we actually have different injury assessment values for gender and size. So it's not just age, but we're already we have small female, mid male, large male. If you'll notice that for the uh, gender and size differences, really it seems that it's the chest deflection and the neck measurements that seem to be the most sensitive. As you can see, the smaller numbers mean that you are allowed less deflection, which means there are, I would call it maybe a more stringent requirement. Now we talk about fragility. Uh, again, this is very similar to what you've seen in many other presentations. We have reduced bone density, uh, osteoporosis. We have structural changes to the geometry rib cage where the ribs actually are changed their, uh, from like 50 to 70 degrees down. There's body mass index. There's also your, your muscle tone. Muscles carry load. So the better your muscle tone, um, you, um, you can carry more uh, injury tolerance and also joint arthritis or some things. Now to get to the, the vehicle factors, pre-crash is primarily active safety. We have some ITS safety information which is coming on and also some of the autonomous. So this is an area that's exploding in potential. I mean in the, in the past, act well, in the past we had lighting, visibility, braking and all the normal crash avoidance technologies. Now with the addition of faster microprocessors, um, we are now pretty much designing vehicles with some, some sensors, laser, radar, et cetera, to do some pretty exciting things. One of the first technologies that came out was ABS, and I guess that was in the early to mid-80s, um, which really controlled wheel slip to try to keep the driver in control. And, and the systems worked well, although they didn't quite have as much benefit as the, the experts actually uh, uh, felt they would. Um, and there's a number of reasons for that that had nothing to do with the actual system itself. However, once you have ABS on your vehicle, the addition of some yaw sensors and some uh, uh, controllers this allows you to put what we call electronic stability control, which really helps individually brake wheels to provide a restoring torque on the vehicle, restoring yaw that keeps the vehicle from spinning out. This technology has turned out to be quite phenomenal in terms of its, its um, benefits. Um, in 2010, I now IHS did analysis and uh, they reported 20% reduction in multiple vehicle crashes and 49% reduction in single vehicle crashes. Now it was also mentioned that this, was, this is mandated as of I think all vehicles by 2012. However, if you've got teenage sons, teenage daughters, you're getting abused cars, this is a technology I would, I would consider trying to see whether they can get on their vehicle. Not to mention for the older folks too. And in a lot of these cases, what's good for the kids is also good for the older folks. The other thing that's becoming a lot more, um, um, well, it's, it's, it's part of rulemaking that uh, will be required. But even in, in, in um, 
anticipation or in not even anticipation before the rulemaking a lot of manufacturers have been putting backup cameras and again this allows the older folks to get a much clearer view of the vehicle around them especially the back without having to crane their neck which they may be more re, uh, reluctant to do um, in the future it's expected that cam camera use may get more frequent and will supplement your conventional side and rear view mirrors and there's even some rulemaking in Europe to consider trying to make it so you had a camera only. And the advantage is there is you can change the field of view and play with some of those things to get you much better um, vision. The other technology that's out there is an adaptive headlamps, which are used to sort of adjust their direction and intensity to provide better illumination in curves, turns, and hills. And again, the whole idea of this is to provide better illumination of the road without providing glare to the oncoming tra uh, traffic. Unfortunately, a lot of these advanced features that you see in Europe on this are not allowed in the US because of some limitations in 108. I know NITS is currently doing a lot of research and is getting ready to do rulemaking to probably correct that. But um, as you can see, this is a illustration and, and this is, so e manufacturers have different versions of this so just take this as just an example not necessarily the only set of beam patterns but again they have some vehicles which you can adapt the height of the vi the, the um, light so that again when you crest a hill you're not flashing the person in front of you that's coming towards you you also have beams that allow you when you're turning or give you a side of where you're going and again you have somewhere you can adjust the uh, intensity of light from both this side to that side so that as you have incoming traffic the side that's put that would be visible by the the incoming traffic dims but you still have a sharper uh, a, a larger beam pattern going out on the other side that's especially helpful for finding pedestrians on this side when you got vehicles coming in especially for the elderly folks you're driving they often will get glare from the oncoming traffic and not see pedestrians on the side so this has some real advantages in that area. One of the other kind of new high-tech stuff is forward collision warning. And again, that's, that's a system that monitors the relative speed and following distance and provides warnings if you look like your closing gap is closing too fast and you're not taking any action. Again, this is a quick, a simple illustration. Again, these are radar, camera. There's various different sensors and what it does, you can see on the dashboard in this installation, it provides a visual warning. There's probably an audio warning as well. Now, take that system to the next level, and at some point, if, the dry, if you have a system that has what they call auto braking collision mitigation, what happens if the driver doesn't heed the warning? Then the system comes in. As you can see here, you have, you know, a danger of a collision you get warning and brake assist that brake assist may be a case where if you're on the brakes it gives you harder braking to help you stop faster because a lot of people don't use all their brakes for whatever reason and then when you get to a, what they what the system figures is a higher level of or danger of collision then you get an automatic braking in a first stage that's that's a certain level and then when this gets very close to a, a real collision then you get a, a, a sharper brake now Again, there's different flavors, so take this as just an example. Each manufacturer is obviously trying to tweak and come up with the next best way of doing it. So they don't all exactly work this way, but this is pretty illustrative. We also have um, lane departure warning and keeping assist. And again, this is again, you do a warning, and then there are some systems that actually provide some lane keeping assistance. And again, if you're sitting there driving and you're, the vehicle is monitoring the lane and you are drifting out of the lane, it will give you a warning. And if you have lane assist as you drift, it will provide a very gentle correcting torque that will bring you back in. Now, you can easily if you override this torque. This is not like the vehicle takes the wheel and says, no, you're going back in your lane. It just gently tries to drift you back in. Now, obviously, if you want to go out of that lane and that you were intending to do that, you just steer through it. Um, one of the key things for infrastructure guys, because we had a presentation there, is 
this requires, a lot of the systems require pretty good lane markings. And so that's a key element for if you can, as part of your road systems, do a, a, a good job of maintaining sharp and well-defined road systems, these systems will work quite well. The problem is when you don't have good, lanes, uh, good roads, uh, lane markings. We also have technologies, uh, blind spot detection. Again, when you're an older person, you're not necessarily checking your blind spot as much as you should. They have these um, um, systems that are designed that have uh, the sensors that will detect the vehicle there. And as you want to turn into that, that lane, if you, that vehicle's there, it'll give you a warning. The other thing, um, and this is not just for older folks. Again, a lot of these work for everything. There's driver attention monitoring, and, and this is really a very broad topic. There's some that are distractions, some, and there's very, very many different flavors of these systems being developed. But really the idea is that for this one, driver fatigue, it's the kind of thing that builds up, and you're not necessarily suddenly realize, oh, I'm tired, I'm falling asleep, you know? And so what it does is it starts looking at your driving pattern as it evolves. So it looks early on at what your, how your steering wheel actions are and then compares them. And in one example, there's different methods, but one is, you know, when you're driving, you're generally correcting pretty consistently, not a lot, but you're doing this. But what happens when you get drowsy? You start kind of doing nothing. And then as you go out of the lane, you go, oh, and you correct. So you have a period of sort of no steering wheel movement and then a jerk. Well, that's a signature that these systems can look at. And as obviously when those gaps get longer and the jerks get sharper, that tells you you're getting more and more fatigue. And it gives you various warnings. Again, unfortunately, this one, you have, it will give you a warning, but it can't pull over and kick you out of the car. <laughs> you, have to, you have to heed the warning. Now, Getting to the horizon, one of the key things that NHTSA and Federal Highway and all have been working on is in ITS, Intelligent Transportation Systems. And again, this is V to V, vehicle to vehicle communication and vehicle to infrastructure. And as you notice from this illustration, you have a vehicle that's spinning out because it's hit ice or hit, this one looks like it hit oil. And what it's doing is it's communicating to the vehicles behind it that there's something going on. And that allows those vehicles to take actions. Now, one of the things I talked about earlier was, for example, forward collision warning and some of those things. They have sensors. However, if you can use the ITS information, you can make those systems a lot better because then you have the additional information directly from the vehicle in front of you. You're not having to measure it. Likewise, when you have, you can have vehicle to infrastructure, you can look at signal timing, you can start anticipating and there's some real safety benefits in terms of intersection related stuff. Uh, again, NHTSA is in the process. I think they're ex they have an AM PM that's been out. I think they're putting their proposal out later this year, I think, isn't it? So now we get back to, you saw this slide earlier. I was like, he stole my slide. The Google car is nothing new in concept. We've been trying to get there forever. I mean, this is from, you know, way back when. Um, However, just like man evolved, so will autonomous driving. We have, right at this point, we have sort of, there's some discussion about what exactly level one, two, three, and four, five is, but largely what you see is as you go up in automation, the driver task goes down. And of course, there's a lot of human factors issues with systems that take control and then if you have a malfunction, you have to give it back. Well, what if the driver's not ready to get it back? How do you, you have forced take, takeover? So, uh, you know, I, as much as I think the Google car really has pushed the envelope and really has stimulated a lot of the, the innovation, even among our members, because they're all working on exactly the same stuff, and I think there's going to be a lot of great stuff coming out of it, there are still some technical, some human factors, and even a lot of legal issues with trying to get to that last point or those last two, the, the level four and level five. So it's on the horizon, it's coming, but you know, it's, it's, it'll, it'll take a little while. And, and again, there's a, everybody's got their own guess as to what year this will come out. And I think if you talk to some 
some manufacturers or some firms, they might give you, you know, dates that are earlier than later. But again, just like evolution, it's probably going to be a steady path to that goal. One of the problems we have is trying to have acceptance on the technology by the elderly population. Um, as you know, they're the type of people, and I know I am, and is you try something, if it's not bone simple, and it doesn't work the first time, you get frustrated with it, and you throw it away. So one of the key challenges to our members is to really, really take this technology and simplify it. Make those interfaces very stable. Make it so that it works easy. It's intuitive. And so that's going to be one of the key challenges for our members as they move these technologies forward. And that will be the key to getting them fully accepted by the elderly so they don't just turn them off. Now, passive safety. This is the, this is the classic automotive safety that's been, you know, it's, it's the crumple zones, the crash testing, and all that stuff. Again, as I've mentioned, you know, age-related declines result in less than tolerance to impact. We work very hard to, to improve our restraint systems, both airbags and the seat belts. And there are some potential countermeasures for future improvements. Again, I've mentioned that the research indicates that, you know, tolerance to, to impact affects all body regions, um, gender effects as well. But as you notice from some of the charts in earlier in the day and some of the ones I have, chest seems to be the big one. And that's primarily because the rib cage, you have a, a lot of reductions in bone mass. You have some structural changes in the rib cage that actually make the force the transmission of force uh, more uh, likely to, to produce injury. Plus, when you have broken um, bones, they often will cause you to go to the hospital, and then there's a lot of the complications that have been documented, like uh, pneumonia, et cetera. This is a simple chart. Uh, a lot of you may not really follow. It's a cumulative uh, risk, and this is for your thorax. And basically what it shows, and I didn't get a chance to get it color-coded, is that there's four graphs there. There's two that are lined together and two that are lined together. The one that's, close, that's closest to me is for the older, and that's the men and women. So there's slight difference between men and women, but the differences between age are much greater. And so obviously, if you look at the 50th percentile level, you have um, probably about 30 five, maybe 40 uh, millimeters of chest deflection to get a 50% of injury, while the younger folks are a little over 50 millimeters. So that gives you an idea of the kind of differences in uh, fragility of the chest. Now, the, the key countermeasures for this are to try to develop ways to reduce the loads that the chest sees. And part of that is fitment of seatbelt pretensioner. So what happens when you're in a crash? You want the seatbelt to, to, at the instant you hit, you want the seatbelt to cinch down. That way you have more opportunity to ride down with what they call load limiter. The load limiter allows the seatbelt load to go to a certain level and then stop and it kind of, and then the, the belt will play out. The problem is that you can only do so much load limiting because at that point the occupant's moving forward and you have, you know, you're constrained by the amount of occupant space in the vehicle. You just can't keep letting them move on this, but it looks like a big rubber band of, that's called a seat belt. So, you know, one of the key challenges for our members is to manage this excursion while uh, limiting the airbag and seat belt loads. Um, the other thing that as we get closer and closer to 100% seat belt use, what ha happens is we probably could go back to NHTSA and talk initiate a conversation about whether the unbelted required regulation that's in there could be modified that would allow softer front airbag systems. That would have real benefits for the older driver in the range of crashes they typically encounter. Because you notice they're dying in lower speed crashes. So, you know, the idea is that if you have a belt, you have, for the younger people, you can still have very high performance because you've got the airbag and the belt working together. And, but you want to have it so that you have a soft enough airbag and soft enough belt system that you're not um, too st uh, stiff for the older occupants, even in the lower severity crashes. <coughs> okay, almost done. Uh, Post-crash. 
one of the key things, obviously, once you're in a crash, getting medical help there ASAP is a major uh, benefit. And um, you all know, you know, GM has their OnStar. I think uh, Ford has some systems. I'm not sure the exact name, but they have, um, and there's other manufacturers have like eCall. There are vehicles out there that are designed to have automatic crash notification. And they have different levels of sophistication. And unfortunately, this is one where it's tying vehicle technology to the infrastructure. So for example, if you're in a major metropolitan area, there's a good chance that your 911 is very sophisticated. And if you have a vehicle that's sophisticated, it can tell you, I crashed, where I am. Oh, by the way, here's the change in velocity or the severity of the crash, the, the direction of the crash. That can go to the what they call like a receiving center. And that information can filter down to the various people who are part of that life-saving chain. Now, if you're out of the la that area, chances are you're probably only going to get a 911 call, maybe some, some um, vehicle location, which is still very beneficial. So one of the challenges as we move forward is to try to work on these systems to try to get them uh, both from an infrastructure standpoint and a vehicle standpoint. And that's it. I guess we'll do the next one, then do questions. All right, I'll get started. Um, so it's E911 Assist is the uh, Ford system, just to, to make sure everybody knows. But um, so I'm from Ford Motor Company. My name is Michelle, as Bonnie introduced uh, uh, me earlier. I'm here to talk about what Ford does and how we design vehicles with the aging in mind. And I have Jim here in the back that I'll call up uh, pretty soon in, through the presentation. Uh, but let me start by talking about Henry Ford. So in 1903, Henry Ford, with $28,000 in cash, started Ford Motor Company. And he did this, his vision was to open the highways to all mankind. And he wanted to do this because he knew there would be a tremendous opportunity if giving people mobility. And so today at Ford, we're focused on creating a strong business, um, building great products that contribute to a better world. And so part of that better world is the older population. So I'm here to focus a little bit on that. And so Ford Motor Company, as a global automotive um, leader, we manufacture and distribute vehicles on six different continents uh, across the world. And uh, we do this and in order to develop great products. We do this by our foundation, our brand pillars. This is what we have bedrocked into how we design and release our vehicles through quality, green, safe, and smart. These are our pillars that we benchmark ourselves against. They're things that customers care about. I am the manager of the Automotive Safety Office at Ford Motor Company. And as Bonnie mentioned, I've worked in safety for 18 years. And so for me, when I come into work every day, this isn't a job, this is a passion to me. I love it, I love my job, I love coming to work. It's really what I care about. Um, I spend a lot of time thinking about it, and so um, hopefully Biden would probably have to kick me out because I could probably be here all day <laughs> talking about it. So um, it really is uh, something I care deeply about, and I'm excited to share some of those things with you and how we do things and focus on the older drivers. And so I think we've seen a couple different ways to look at this chart, but uh, the uh, aging population is really the, the growth demographic and Scott has taken through and several other people you know that they really are at higher risk uh, when they do get an injury so I'm going to tell you how we're designing cars with that in mind and so it really starts by research so even coming to this conference and the things that I've heard today taking that back understanding the things that I've learned it's what Ford Motor Company is doing the different research that we do um, Jim's going to come up here in a second we're going to talk about our age soup that um, we developed and how we use that when we're designing our interfaces and really helping people understand the challenges we have with older drivers. And we take that research and we put it into our requirements, making sure that as we design products, we continue to enhance them and improve them with the information that we have. 
We also um, are constantly uh, making and um, creating new tools, and then innovation, how that research and insight goes into the new features and technologies that we use. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the tools and innovation also. And so I'm going to start with some of the biomechanic research that Ford Motor Company is doing. And we heard a little bit about that today as we age, our bone density changes, our geometry changes. And so we're looking at that and figuring out how do our models need to change. We have um, vehicle age dependent human models that we use that information, we put it into the models and try to understand how our restraint systems need to change and adapt as we understand what happens in vehicle crashes and how that changes the reaction that we see. We also are looking at advanced sensors, so understanding who's driving, who the occupant is, you know, what characteristics they have, and how we can better design our restraint systems to ta really tailor it to the person that's in the vehicle. We also are looking at crash data trends, and Scott touched a little bit about that um, on, as older people, the older um, population has a higher injury risk. And when you look at that, those crash trend data, and you look at them even further, what you find is that people over 75 um, have even a higher risk of incidents happening in the field, and even more in the second row seat. And so one of the things we did as we learned and tried to figure out what we can do with that is we designed our inflatable seat belt. It was first launched on the 2011 Explorer, and we're now implementing across our fleet as we design new vehicles. And what this does is it really disperses the energy across the chest, and so it, it really manages the energy five times more than a traditional seatbelt. And so somebody that is vulnerable to chest deflection or chest or rib um, cracks, they, this is really something that is helpful for your, all occupants, but particularly those that can be vulnerable to uh, chest injuries. Not only um, that, when, since we've had it in the field, we've gotten feedback that people actually, because it is padded in the seatbelt, people do find it to be pretty comfortable. I don't have any popcorn, but I do have films, several of them. <laughs> and so what other kind of research are we doing? So we talked a little bit about the biomedical research that we're doing to understand bone density and geometry and how we're bringing that into our models so we can better design our restraints. But we also, and Scott um, also touched on this, but how, how do we design our vehicles? The thing that people touch and see and use every day when they drive. And so when we do studies, we do studies across the population. And so we design our vehicles for everyone that drives them or rides in them. But it's really important to make sure that we include the older population when demographic when we're doing this. We really learn a lot from them. So looking at things like glare, how much does your IP reflect onto your windshield? How can you change the design of that IP, the curvature, to mitigate that, gl that glare? Uh, reach, you know, where is uh, the radio located? How can you open the center council to reach your tissues? People ha will have less mobility. We learn a lot about setting up our requirements to make sure that we put them in places that are good for people to actually reach and efforts, how much does it take to open a door? Uh, legibility, what kind of font should we use? What color should the font be? What would the contrast be? How big should it be? A lot of these things, we are really getting insight from older drivers. How easy to use, and I don't just mean like, can you push the button? But when you push the button, do you know what to do next? And those things are really, really, really important. And so with that, I'll have Jim come up to the front. And so we can all thank Jim. I was begging several people and to, uh, to do this. So this is our Ford, what we call our Ford third age suit. Um, and so looking at the, the third age, and so, so Jim, how many years do you think that that feels like? I mean, because you're like, what, 25? Exactly. I'm yeah. 24 years old, and I, I just added 24 to the suit. Yeah, well, all I know is when I was standing out there before we were coming in, Jim's like, can you get me a drink? And I'm like, yeah, I think they have stuff down there. And he goes, would you have your, would you go get a drink for your grandpa? And I was like, oh, you're right. I'm like, would you like me to go get it for you? <laughs> he really, he was standing here and didn't want to walk down to the cafeteria <laughs> to get, get his drink. But basically, we, we use this as an empathy tool. And it really is. So, so Jim, how does it feel? Um, I think what I found, th this is the first time I've put the suit on. I've worked with it before. I do presentations for Ford. But I think it's just the mobility of actually walking, the weight of it. I have a um, weight on my foot. Um, I just felt I was walking like my grandfather on the farm back up in Maine, and it was 
to stop. Then I got into the vehicle and tried to turn to, as I was um, working with um, Parker Pitch out in the yard, and just trying to turn this way or that way with my head was very difficult as well. And then getting in and out of the car um, with the weight and then lifting up my legs where I have weight here and weight here. Um, this stimulates that I'm, I'm coming off my um, elbow. Um, also in the fingers, it's just the mobility is extremely restricted compared to my 54 year old body, which also is restricted. <laughs> <laughs> But no, that, I mean, that's really points. That's really important, you know, the, the ability to be able to touch and feel and how those gloves and how we design. I mean, there's lots of touch, touch strings that are going into vehicles and really understanding, you know, how that is to, to change the buttons and how big do they need to be. And there's even a, a motor there that, that helps um, simulate the onset of um, Parkinson's di disease if we really want to torture you. I don't have the motor gloves. <laughs> I don't have the motor gloves. Right. Right. Yeah, and if he couldn't see you guys, but if he puts the glasses on, you know, it's really to simulate different levels of um, cataracts and things like that. And then if you put the, the, the ear protection, it would simulate hearing loss, which would be like me talking to my husband every day. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> oh, you heard that. <laughs> yeah, my husband has selective hearing too. Um, <laughs> but it really does help us educate our designers and engineers. I mean, there's many times I go into the studio and I go, you know, you can't have, you know, the CD case located in, you know, way behind there. People use their CDs all the time. We can't, we can't do it. Oh, you know, I can reach right here. It's a small car. And it, okay, put the suit on, you know. And, and so then, you know, your conversation changes and, and you really start understanding. And I think it's really difficult for people to, you can have requirements, you can tell people these things, but really when you, when you actually try to move and, and do stuff, it, it, it changes you. Are you asking do it? Yeah, I, so if you could just do a couple laps. I, I, <laughs> you know. I tried turning, and this is, um, this, um, this stimulates um, actual stimulation. And, um, and then to turn in the back with a blind spot, and then turning with a console that we all use for our pitches or on the side, and then looking this way, and then turning with this motor back. And then the fingers as well, and then sensory on um, pushing the button or figuring out you know, where, where you're controlling your Good. Well, thanks, Tim. Thank you. So we looked at the suit and said, so what, what kind of things have come out of the suit? And I, I talked a bit about our touchscreen um, controls. We just released a new, um, our Sync um, Gen 3 screen where we've really made some changes and, and done some different things because of that age suit. We also um, have power liftgate um, uh, doors or um, back hatches and also um, seats, power seats are very helpful. But these are things that, and Scott touched on this too, a lot of times what we, we learn from maybe the older or aging population, but they, they really help everyone else. And the 360 degree exterior handle is, is one of those things. And I'm a mom and I, there's many times that I've come out of the grocery store with you know, one kid in hand, the other kid around my leg and a bag of groceries and I'm trying to open the door. And so, you know, I really understand how something as simple as a 360 degree handle, meaning that, you know, it, so it really hurts to lift up if you have arthritis. And so just being able to come at that at any angle, depending on how much mobility you have is important. And how many of you guys have been driving around and see someone with their cap fuel just falling open? And so, yes, the easy fuel is really great if you have issues with dexterity and ability for your wrist to move. But believe me, everyone needs this fuelless uh, capsule, especially me. And then personalized al alerts, you saw the earmuffs and the hearing, and um, you know I, I'm pretty sure that my husband needs it on full blast, but um, we'll ta I'll talk a little bit about our uh, driver assist features, and we have the ability for those alerts to have different um, hearing um, uh, levels, and so you can adjust it to what you need personally. And so our, this is an example of our 2015 um, Taurus and some of the driver assist technologies on it. I'm not going to go through all of these, but I'm going to highlight a couple that I really think are, are, have the ability to really support older drivers. And so this is the collision warning um, with brake support. And what this does is it's a radar system that if it detects that a con collision is near, it will provide the driver with an audible alert and a visual alert and it begins to charge the brakes which are really important because if somebody doesn't have the ability to 
move on to the brake quick enough or a lot of times they're not pushing the brake. The brakes are charged and ready to go. Right? Hydraulics are ready. So as the brake pedal um, is, is pressed even gently, it brings the vehicle to a stop. And of course, I have a video. I'm pretty sure that I would sound that good when I was explaining if I would have that music like in the background, but I don't know. Okay, so blind spot detection, and you guys saw Jim, like he was really struggling to move his neck. And so I think this is a great technology because it's really not intrusive, but if someone's in your blind spot, it just shines a little light to let you know that they're there. And so it really is a support system if people are having trouble um, moving their neck that they're able to, to see it. And then the cross traffic alert, which uh, let you know if somebody is in your cross um, traffic as you're backing up and I have a video that does it better than me. And then our active park assist. And so if you haven't taken the opportunity, we have, if you go down to the first uh, floor and just out the front doors that you came in, there's a big tent, it says Ford. Um, Jim's out there with um, another lady, Vanessa, and they have um, two 15 edges with this technology on. It is, it is way cool. It, it's great for um, older drivers, but people like me that are really, really challenged with um, parallel parking. Uh, so I didn't grow up in a city, and every time I go to a city, like I, I told the people when they sent me here, I said, and Scott stayed with me, I said, we have to be in a hotel by the metro because I'm not renting a car. Because <laughs> I cannot, I'm like, these Boston people will not be able to handle it if I have to parallel park somewhere. So for people like me that are absolutely challenged, um, this is a, a great technology. I am very impressed with how well it works. And you, the driver is still responsible for the throttle and the brake, but it, the car basically walks you through the steps that you need to do. You push a button, it finds the parking spot, it tells you when to shift, it tells you when to brake, it walks the driver through the entire process and it's really great. And the new Edge actually also has the perpendicular um, park, so if you wanna back up into a parking space, which is, is great as well. So make sure that you get an opportunity to try it out. I think they're gonna have the reception down there. And so they are down there. So I have a video, of course. And I think that's an important thing that I've heard today um, em emulated a lot is, you know, what we're showing here is our focus. You know, this isn't our Lincoln luxury vehicle, and that's our Ford Edge out there with this technology. So many of the technologies I've talked about today aren't just on our Lincolns. They're on many of our vehicles across our platform, and that's really what Ford is all about. Um, coming in the future, uh, soon this year, uh, we have our pre-collision assist with um, pedestrian detection. So this is building on that first technology of the radar system of detecting a potential um, collision. It adds a camera. And so if the customer or if the driver doesn't, doesn't actually respond to the alert, which is that's what we, the goal is, is to have the driver break, have the driver respond to the alert, and the crash is intimate, we will automatically 
uh, break the vehicle. And so this is a technology that we're soon to be releasing this year. And so building on a lot of the technologies that I've talked about coming in the future, Scott mentioned it, vehicle to vehicle communications, Ford is, has a leadership position in developing many of these technologies through many of our um, partners uh, across the industry. We're also working on automation um, and building on our driver assist technologies. I just talked about the auto braking. We have many more in the pipeline that we're working on. And the, both automation and communications are part of our smart mobility plan. And so I talked, I started this about Henry Ford and his vision for increasing mobility for everyone. And so that is the heart of what Ford Motor Company is about. And so we just launched 25 mobility experience, experiments, and these really are to change the way mobility is looked at and bring it to the next level. And so I think if I, obviously don't have time to talk about all 25 of these, but if I had to pick one or two, um, I would talk about our e-bike that we just launched in Europe because it really builds on some of the technology I, I just took you through. It has an ultrasonic sensor on the e-bike and that was the one that we used with the park assist. And so this sensor will provide a warning to the driver if a vehicle is coming up on the bike, and so it will um, vibrate the ham handlebars. It will also um, provide a light to the driver so they know. And it also works with an, app, uh, with an app that you can download on your iPhone, and so you can put in the directions on where you wanna go, and then the bike will actually vibrate the handlebars so you know which way to turn. It will also automatically put on the tur a turn signal f for the bike. And what's really cool about the bike is it's collapsible. And so it, all, it is all about how do you combine bike with all of the rest of urban transportation. So someone can put the bike in their vehicle, go to the transit or the metro station, ride the metro in, then take the e-bike to their final destination. We also have that same bike, but done as a more of a focus for commercial use, and so it fits into like our transit. So if you had somebody that was a mail carrier or a UPS type person, that they would use that then transit vehicle that the e-bike would go in, and then they would bring it into the city and then use the, the e-bike to get the package to its destination. And so we have all different exper uh, experiments going on all over the map trying to figure out how to better use connectivity, how to better use the, all of the technologies that we're developing, and how does it integrate into that larger transportation um, system. And so, you know, my portion of that is looking at safety and how we can change the way the world moves, but do it in a really safe manner. So, thank you. So we have time for a few questions. Does anyone have questions for Scott? Yes. Yeah, so I don't know the exact answer to your question, but our dealers are the first face to our customers, and what you're talking about is really, really important. And I at Ford have been involved in developing some of the videos that you saw are available. I just got them from YouTube. They're not like some Ford secret videos that I have on my computer. They are on the web, and we did that, and you can easily get through them through all of our website, really to address some of the questions that you're talking about. And so that's, you know, that input is the things that I can bring back. And I, I have full faith that we have people working on that, but I don't have the answer to your question. I'm sorry. Any other questions? Yes. I just wanted to talk about um, the Genesis uh, charging station. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I mean, 
I'm not, I know there's various flavors of that technology. So some of those flavors may be more affected by that than others. Obviously, I would, I typically refer to our members as in an arms race to do it better. And so I would say that there's probably some systems that do have issues there. There may be some systems that have developed some other sensors that can be more adaptive at looking at where, well, if I don't have lane sensors, lane markings, well, what else is out there to give me an indication of where I need to go? So I don't have an exact answer for you, but I do, I do know that generally your lane markings is an issue, and you get a lot of false positives, which is like you're drifting, and the, the driver doesn't like to hear he's drifting when he knows he's not drifting. That's, that, is a, that is an issue that, um, you know, and again, I think one of the things you noticed from the Google, he was talking about how GPS and other sensors allow that car to know its lane very well. And, it's, and some, of those, some of that technology might migrate into some of these sensors. So it may not necessarily be driving the car, but it's giving the, the, the driver a much better signal as to when he's in his lane and when he's out of his lane. Ellie? Yeah, my understanding is all these features are, can be turned off. Um, I know electronic stability control was early on. There was a whole big dif discussion about whether they should be able to be turned off as part of the regulation. And NHTSA finally realized that people are not generally turning them off. And there are times which you need to turn it off because it's, let's say, heavy snow and you have certain traction issues. But um, yeah, generally, vehicle manufacturers want to give the driver control. And so while we try to make that feature work in as many environments as possible, um, there are a lot of environments that these vehicles go in that we don't even have a clue as to what, what's really going on. I mean, people take them off road, et cetera. So you know, that to have a system that would be constantly giving you false warnings because you're in you some, you would not pay attention. So the idea is they generally do give you an off but I think a lot of them reactivate when you do a key cycle. So you might turn it off, but next time you get in the car, it reactivates it so that you don't forget that you have it off. Yes. Oh, believe me, I want to. <laughs> we, we, we have automotive gestures for that. But. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> I'm not aware of anything that we offer, but there's probably somebody out there that has noise canceling headphones. <laughs> not that I would suggest you drive with them, <laughs> but. I would say our Lincolns are really quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? I, one last thing I was going to mention the flip side of what John asked is from the DOT perspective, do you, do you work with the DOTs to find out what our, what our limits are? Because we don't know. Like, I'm just thinking when we put in our pavement markings, we don't know what the limits of um, detection are, let's say, from vehicles. But it would be very interesting for us to know that so we can go back when we're putting together our minimum requirements. It would be really helpful for us to hear what cars are working on numerically. Yeah, again, th that question is, is past above my pay grade in some <laughs> respects. Um, but as I mentioned in the other one, I, I know that a lot of them detect off of lane markings. I think there are other mechanisms, as you suggested, that allow you to, as a driver, to understand you're in your lane. 
And I think as vehicles get more intelligent, as you saw from some of the, the autonomous vehicle, that intelligence could be able to make the lane departure a lot better. And I, I assume that's part of that arms race that our members are trying to do is they want, they, I think they like the technology. They want to make the technology so that it pleases its customers. And so as they add more sensors for, let's say, other things, those sensors then can be used to look at your lane. And, and maybe some, some intel, you know, artificial intelligence algorithms allow you to m do a much better job of not bothering the person when it's, you know, even though the lane markings disappear, it's pretty clear that from the surroundings and the radar signature, you're still pretty good and you're not drifting into some danger. So it doesn't, so it suppresses that, that uh, warning. We've run out of time and I thank everyone for coming and Scott and Sal, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.